Have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? This can't be. Be what? Be real? It's going into replication. Hey, Pop. Still nothing. It's gone. It's gone. Tank, we're going to need a signal soon. We got a fibrillation. APOC, location, targeting almost there. And welcome back. I'm Randy Moggins, and this is Off Planet Radio. As we close out the final days of the month of February in the year of 2022, we just passed through this ridiculous... 222 2022 window so people were out busy decoding that yeah let's continue to do the illuminati's work for them huh all of these all of these mind traps are laid to keep you busy with trivialities and things that divert you from what your real purpose in life is and the life on the internet has not gotten better it's a distraction zone it's a place of frivolity it's a place where people are basically pissing their time away instead of doing something meaningful. So this show tonight may go a little ways, hopefully a long way towards correcting some of that. Um, <laughs> but wherever you're at right now, you've got to stop playing the machine's game back to it. This is a time to get real. And if you look at the headlines in the world right now, all they want to do is trump up the next, oops, sorry, didn't mean to say trump, up the next game to engage you. And in around 2009, I took a real hard look at what I believed about this country. And I started to thread back through all of it, and having obviously gone through uh, my early roots in the Christian Patriot movement. I began to thread back through and go, when, where did America go wrong? You know, was it um, Roosevelt, frankly the, frankly the Red? You know, it was, it was that socialization program that they gave us. It was, it was World War II. It was World War I. It was the institution of the Federal Reserve, the income tax. You keep going back through time. You bump into something called the 14th Amendment. You get a little closer. But even before that, the Reconstruction, the Civil War, the period before the Civil War, you look at tr court decisions from the Supreme Court in 1791, and they're already mixing maritime commercial law with common law. Go back further. The founding documents, what did it all mean? What did it all amount to in the end? And where, where was America ever good? And the, when you look back on it, you go... In some ways, it never was. It wasn't a pure dream. Go to the Jamestown colony and look at the paperwork that's still in a glass case, and you realize that all along this has been a commercial venture by the money holders of this world. To that end, tonight, my guest who is with me has spent uh, a fair amount of his life and a huge amount of effort and diligence researching and collating information that you need to know about the past and the story of America, the story of what this construction really is and how we begin to untangle ourselves from it. He is uh, a researcher, a writer, an author. He calls himself a jurist and he has authored a book that was released in I believe 2000 entitled The Red Amendment, and he is currently, along with uh, being the author of the book, uh, at the forefront of a group called the People's Awareness Coalition, and it is a, an educational group aimed at extricating people from the system. I'll, I'll put it that way, and he can correct it. I want to welcome back, after seven long years, uh, we welcome back to the show the author of The Red Amendment. L.B. Bork, welcome back, my friend. Oh, thanks for having me. 
It has been a long time. Yeah, uh, as I said, time <laughs> yeah. being what it is, it's kind of wild past all of us. It's it's good to have you back, though. It's good to, good to talk again, LB. You too. Uh, I kind of miss all the people in the movement because, uh, like you mentioned before we stepped on air here today, uh, you were taking time off, and that's what I've been doing too for the for the most part, kind of stepping back and analyzing what needs to be done uh, to combat this nightmare called the internet and uh, wokeness <laughs> oh. that they came up with. Yeah. Wokeness is like the counterfeit awakeness that the other side it puts is. out. Both of them, by the way, are really not very good toe holes in the reality. Um, right. I, like I said in my opening rant, I look more and more at the Internet. I don't want anything to do with it um, because I see how the well has been poisoned now. It was a useful thing for outreach at one time to be able to locate people who were interested in change, but it's now become salted with the vile spewings of a, a lot of mm, imitative, jerky, um, malfeasant information that's not information, it's just more um, ways to get eyeballs on pages on websites and on right. social media platforms. Let's talk a little bit about the beginning, because your beginning goes back many decades ago. Like mine, you were sort of part of this fomenting patriot movement that began, I don't know, late 80s, early 90s. But you kind of got into the movement around 1993. Talk about that. Talk about your roots, your beginnings, and where this journey took you, LB. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back a little further, because... It's important for people to know that I don't uh, put up with nonsense. <laughs> uh, when I was about four or five years old, I was asking my parents or mother so many questions about Santa Claus that she had to tell me that uh, it was false because I had so many, you know, scientific or quest uh, technical questions about how how's he get all over the world in one night? That can't happen. There's no way. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, so she finally had to tell me. So I've always been awake uh, to the nonsense. And uh, I believe that the Cinderella stories and all these things that uh, people are told is ch children is just a basis or a foundation for people buying lies when they get to an adult stage, you know. But uh, my beginnings in the movement uh, started, I don't know, I got a letter from uh, a congressman when I had my business back in uh, 89, somewhere in there. I just kind of couched it at the time. But then, like you mentioned, this uh, patriot movement seemed to pop up in uh, 92 or 3, somewhere in there. And I think it's all orchestrated. Uh, it's the controlled opposition that they started to uh, bring about, like Ross Perot, for example, is uh, a person I got interested in, just mm -hmm. like a lot of people mm -hmm. got interested in Ron Paul, which I believe he was a plant also oh, yeah. to a point. So that's what got me going. Um, I kind of shelved it. Like I said, I had a business that did pretty well, um, was doing well, but it was getting harder every year to handle things. And uh, I can't imagine how people run a business today it's got to be next to impossible but uh, I, I foresaw that so I closed the business back in about 96 and got into talking with different people and things uh, before that actually a little bit about 93 like you mentioned but I stopped listening to Patriots about 96 and that's when I started to look and do my own research because, uh, like you've noted to me, that uh, there's a lot of disinformation out there. And uh, when I was looking back at how things work, uh, you have my book, The Red Amendment. And yeah. uh, um, if you look in research, the 14th Amendment, which that's a reference to, there is nothing on sections two, three, and four. There are very little if you do find anything. Most of the uh, 
influence or impact is on section one which has created the main damage but uh no one's analyzed two three and four and the courts surely haven't and it's kind of cryptic and uh that told me or it tells me two things people don't do their own research because no one's written about it not even uh, lawyers or judges haven't uh law reviews can't find anything a matter of fact, my book, or one of my writings, uh, getting off track here a little bit, but one of my writings, Treason by Design, has showed up in thesis papers for law schools. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, three, we've, uh, between my uh, friend Nathan and I, we've uh, found three uh, three different references uh, to cover a Christian college, and I, I think one was, he said either Harvard or uh, Yale Law School. Interesting. So my work is recognizable. You know, it's, it makes sense in sense. So uh, anyway, it, it told me two things. No one does their own research, and people repeat what they've heard. And I believe that everything, for the most part, has been, uh, you know, just disinformation from day one or misrepresented information or half-truths. And that's why we're in a mess today. And I didn't start learning until I did my own thinking and research uh, back about 96. And I started People's Awareness Coalition in uh, 1998, wrote the Red Amendment. And uh, here we are today, just about 25 years later. And it's a bigger mess than it was uh, 25 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's by far a bigger mess. We're much, much further down the slippery slope. In fact, we're... We've basically scraped off most of our faces sliding down the iceberg that is this thing. Um, yes. As they have, you think about what's transpired between 1992 and now, and you've got two major mass events. You have the 2001, you can call it an attack on America. It was really America attack, attacking itself, which is classic. Well, that goes back to burning the Reichstag, doesn't it? And then, of course, obviously, you know, the current brouhaha, which is the virus and the vaccines and the social engineering that's occurred. But we're, we're in a place where I think, like all of these events, um, they have the effect on one level. And on the other level, they have the effect of the legal and opposite, which is it wakes a few more people up to at least... The idea that something is wrong, when I think people realized, a, they were, they were being locked in their own ho homes, literally, locked down. They were being socially isolated. Their businesses were forced to close, not for, uh, not for two weeks or whatever period of time it was to flatten the curve, but, in fact, for you know three, six, eight, nine, some businesses have never reopened again. Like you said earlier, how hard is it to run a business? Well, I look around this area I live in, which is bordering on a major metropolitan area. Hundreds of businesses have closed in the last 18 months. It's never to be seen again. Most of them small, private, owned businesses. So effect is that a lot of people have lost everything in this. And out of that, a few are, are waking up, at least to the point where they can almost formulate reasonable questions at this point. How did we get here? How did we lose our rights? Why are people being forced by corporate entities to take a medicalization process as a, as a qualifier to hold a job or occupation? We're there. We're at that point. This is, as far as I'm concerned, and I've said it publicly for actually before 2020, that we were at this breaking point. We were at the point where we were absolutely going to go through the floor on this, and, and it's happened. And so in all of that, you're looking back on, on, the peris on this periscope of history in your own time and realizing that pretty much everything you were taught was skewed either deliberately or because people parrot what they've heard and you began to do your own research out of your own leading that there was something deeper than this. So 
as you go into this, you, you published the Red Amendment in, in 2000. There's a lot of time there. What was the formative thinking that you went through as you went through doing the research for this? Because there's a phenomenal amount of research within the book and within the work that you put out through PAC. Uh, geez. I uh, was into the gun thing back in the 90s and uh, when I got into the movement. I was as nutty as some of the militia people were back then as they are today. Uh, I traded all my books in for law books, so to speak. Or guns, rather. Sorry. Um, so I started to read the Constitution, and really the Second Amendment is a joke. And the way I see it, they let us keep guns, meaning Americans, to kill each other. Because even Biden said it, the kook that that guy is, criminal, uh, this last month, I heard him, you know, I, I kind of keep an eye on these guys just to, to see what they're up to. Uh, but he said, uh, I don't know why you need uh, assault rifles, because we've got the bomb. You know, yeah. it, it's like very psych psychopath mentality. Well, you know, it, it, it goes to a point that I've said for a long time, because you remember the, the nuttiness that was the Patriot Movement. It was epitomized by the Montana Freeman and right. the stuff that they were doing with all of this funny paper and fiduciary instruments that they were using. But I'm right. thinking, in your mind, and we'll, we'll take the, cap, the so-called capital insurrection of January 6th last year as an example, all the guns that we can amass as private citizens are nothing when the governments of the world are sitting on military armed to the teeth. They can level an entire city in five minutes. Really? You think you're going to stand up to them with guns? Right. Anyway, this gets back to why I got rid of my guns, because at my, you know, awakening to all this, I said... The only way through this is exposing the fraud and the lies and use their law against them. That is the only way. And right now, what we have on our side is people have been lied to. And if we can awake them to the truth that they've been lied to and defrauded to, to the nth degree, we'll get them on our side. And I think that is what scares the powers that be the most. Do you think there's, are we anywhere near a meaningful engagement of that? I wonder about that sometimes. Not really, because, you know, everyone's left pack, and it makes me think that uh, everything that uh, transpired in the last 20 years is maybe all planned opposition or infiltration. Uh, no one's been serious. It, it seems like uh, I can't. You mentioned the uh, Montana Freeman. I was actually close to that. Uh, I knew someone in Arizona that actually was going to get prosecuted along with uh, uh, th those Freeman. They they were locked up in uh, their so-called compound, whatever, up in Montana and. I had a friend in Arizona at the time, and I didn't follow what he was doing because I was still in that, you know, position or space of doing my own research and figuring things out. Uh, but he, he was actually called by the FBI to go up there and talk the uh, Schweitzer out. And I was at his office when they came and uh, gave him the money for expenses to go up there and talk him out. They never did use him. But he did go up there. Uh, so I guess that's just one testimony, uh, testimonial piece that shows that I've been in the movement and I've been around uh, what you you have also. And uh, we're a dying breed and uh, really needs to uh, we need to get out there and come about to get this thing uh, picked back up where it was, because uh, we, we talked about uh, the commandeering of the movement happened with the uh, freedom to fascism, I believe, 
that happened about 2008, 2010 in that period of time. But uh, yeah, Pac, uh, I don't know. Do you know of Gary Franchi? I've, I've heard the name before. Yeah, he uh, kind of teamed up with Aaron Russo, and uh, who, who showed up about the same mm-hmm. time we, we were talking about ni- the early 90s, and yeah. he had the, the movie Mad as Hell. And I, I believe he was, uh, you, you said the, or we talked about a few minutes ago that the, the movement just seemed to pop up out of nowhere. Well, he was part of fanning the flames for that, and I believe he was planned opposition. So to start the anarchy mentality of people in America. As I recall, Russo's big screed was specifically against the income tax, correct? Correct. And uh, I talked with him. I saw him in person in Chicago. Where he yelled at me for cutting in line, and I, he was talking to someone else that knew him, supposedly. And he said, get back to the line. I go, I don't want your autograph. I want to talk about the mistakes in the movie. <laughs> And you're, the, you know, you're going to do part two. I want to be on part two. And it, nothing transpired. He was an operative man. Freedom to fascism was uh, meant to get people screwed up and commandeer the law movement and turn it into a political movement. And they did that effectively with uh, Twitter and Facebook and the millennials. Uh, can I ever say that word? Millennials? Yeah. The millennials, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they've uh, totally got these people messed up. And all they do is, like you said, gossip and uh, waste time on, uh, you know, the Internet. And it is, that's what's happened. Yeah, I was watching it happen. And uh, I know you are, too. And that's why I think we both just kind of stepped back and tried to figure out what needs to be done. And I, I know what needs to be done. Us dinosaurs have to pick this back up. <laughs> and I have been working with some good people to, you know, rebirth all this. But uh, they, they've been dumbed down to the nth degree right now. Because yeah, law, law is their Achilles, is their Achilles heel. So you, you said, said something interesting. You made the distinction between political activism and the law. And this is right. really important. And I'll back it up one step further because the income tax is a real stumbling block. Trust me, I know this. Um, I wound up going sideways with the IRS personally right. around 2007. And I made a lot of errors because I came at it from the standpoint of more or less the political side of it. There were, besides the freedom to fascism movement, there were a lot of people out there that were putting a lot of information out, filing all kinds of documents and papers and declaring all things. You can't untangle something like the income tax until you know the fundamentals. And this is the difference between what you do. And I have to say you at this point, because you're, you're the one man standing in all this, that you unravel it from the back end where this whole thing was tied together in this giant ball of thread that was tossed at us as a country. Uh, I went back in time far enough to realize that whatever purity there was in the establishment of the republic, so-called, was also, there was within that a certain level of authentic authenticity, but at the same time it was sort of sown with seeds of its own destruction within it. And that being, I would, you know, I would start with, the Bill of Rights and even even the Constitution itself as being spectacularly flawed documents that really didn't do what they said they would do. What's your take on that? Well, definitely there were problems with the Constitution. Uh, I didn't start to learn until I went back and looked at research, uh, such as Soames' Institutes of uh, Roman law. I had to separate them from Vittel. Yeah. But uh, that, that's how I, I did my research. I would, you know, all these patriots are saying, saying, uh, well, you got to read case law. 
so I did. Then I soon conjured up or came up with the uh, the rule that PAC, uh, you know, is foundational on is how how to study law. You don't read case law. So what I did is I would look at what the judges were using as references. Well, this guy said that or that guy said this or this comes from there. And I go, well, why do I need these people? I'm going to go direct to their sources. And that's what I did. Uh, Battelle's Law of Nations was one of them. And, uh, yeah, the, you know, I read that. Explain a little bit more what that is because that's a, that's a towering document. Yeah, it's very extensive, and I believe he was a uh, operative. I think he put it together as kind of a preemptory rule book for the overlay they've done with all the countries in the world, which is basically based on the Communist Manifesto. So they could control things and uh, operate in a certain manner. Of course, the Law of Nations goes all the way back to the Roman Empire, and uh, periods before that with the Greek Empire, or Greek uh, Republic. And uh, they, they've just, uh, he put that book together to control uh, the nations. It's called uh, Just Gentium, Law of Nations, Justice for Nations. And it's interesting that Gentile and Gentium kind of have the same, yeah, it piece, does. same mm -hmm. meaning. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, it's, and that gets back to the uh, synagogue of Satan, mm -hmm. Satan controlling everything, because they're not considered a nation, ultimately, except for fake Israel. That's a whole other story in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, it fits with the Bible and uh, what some of the, the members of that uh, religion, which is divided as Christianity, uh, have, you know. But again, that's getting into real deep things. I don't know if we want to go into that tonight. Oh uh, well, I, well, we we can always go there later because um, yeah, yeah. That that was my early days on shortwave radio was talking about that stuff. Yeah, uh, obviously, it's it's important, but it's not. See, the way I look at things, we have to deal with what we got yeah. in front of us. Yeah, because anything we do that we didn't witness or we can't evidence today, it's speculation. Because we can't trust the documents or the history that's given to us. Yeah. So we just can speculate. And that's what I've done with a lot of the, the past things. If it's hell, you know, that's documented. They use that. So that's something you can hang your hat on, so to speak, you know. Um, and that's what I did, and I started reviewing that, and I uh, read through it, and, you know, I, I read all through the U.S. Code. I read all 50 uh, titles. Wow. Uh, I've read, uh, you know, a lot of uh, court uh, opinions and cases, and basically the way I do things is I'll skim it. Uh, you know, I'll read the first part of something and the last part and just skim the rest of the document to save time because mm -hmm. uh, it's a waste of time. And I told you before the show, I don't read and I don't read to the point where uh, I'm reading uh, the adversary's opinions, be it uh, 1984 and Animal Farm yeah. and all these just controlling documents because yeah. the, they're just opinions and programming people. Yes, they have truth in them, and I like to use that. And I was going to bring up the, the Matrix. You, know, you had it in your intro. Yep. And uh, that was disinformation or uh, programming also. So of course it, it, it never ends. Uh, I was going to read the... Um, I getting off track on a rabbit trail, maybe, but the quote at the end of the uh, the movie, the first uh, episode or version, uh, the movie, uh, The Matrix, the first one was uh, the quote at the end said, "I'm going to show them a world without you, a world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries, a world where anything is possible. Where we go from here is a choice I leave to you." To me, that's anarchy. And uh, if you look at uh, these people that are doing a lot of this, uh, they have a thing called 
uh, anarcho-capitalism. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, was, it was funny. I just uh, rewatched uh, a book. Uh, or a, it was a, not a book, but the uh, the book, the Anarchist Cookbook. And the author was William Powell, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Uh, last night I watched a movie documentary on him, and the you know the it was made to grill him, and you know ask him why why'd you write this? It's destroyed a lot of things. And that was birthed out of the uh, Vietnam War and people, uh, which I believe was all form formulated. The hippie movement, all that was done on purpose to cause uh, change in government and distract people. But the, the point of that is that they wanted people to rebel and create havoc instead of doing it peacefully. That is part and parcel the co the communist way. So I I don't know for sure. I don't. I think he was operating honestly, but who knows? Because his dad was he worked for the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I can't help but think that it was put out there to raise havoc. I've found this to be a consistent pattern. Even with this show up into, I would say, the last few years of people that occasionally have been on the show. And when I looked more into them and saw the people that they were affiliated with and the organizations they worked with and their various activities, I had huge questions about how they could have such a such a zeal for so-called freedom when they were working for the very oppressive organizations, and it usually winds up somebody's working for the UN somewhere along the way, which, um, you know, is one sign. But what's disturbing is that you brought up anarchy, and this is an important point. Maybe just bring this in now. We saw anarchy in the United States last summer. We saw it in the streets. It was funded anarchy. It was it was funded basically uh, domestic terrorism on steroids. All of it stagecraft, all of it designed to destabilize the already fragile psyche of of the American people specifically. Because I'm talking about obviously BLM and Antifa and the burning of you know city blocks and the sacking of businesses and private property. And the question becomes then, how do we approach having a structured, organized, civilized society when the very institutions that we have now are actually the sponsors of these types of programs? In other words, how do you bring law out of a lawless organism? Well, as I mentioned, all this, what's going on, is they're calling it... Uh, Neo, uh, neo liberalism, uh, Marx, neo -liberalism yeah. or I, I can say even the people that call themselves uh, classic li liberals, it, that's bullshit. It's, excuse my language, but oh, that's th 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 this is that's part and parcel of the, the progressive manner of, of what they've done. Uh, you know, that's how they talk. Uh, you know, the uh, McCarthy hearings, that was all planned, too. Uh, mm -hmm. You can tie McCarthy back to being uh, coached by the Jesuits. That was a dog and pony show to uh, send Americans off the scent of communism being installed in America. And anyone that questioned uh, that would be, you know, pegged a, cute, uh, a kook like they did McCarthy. He, he was just a, a useful idiot to get mm -hmm. that pushed mm -hmm. through, to uh, squelch uh, the growing communist uh, faction that was growing, you know, with FDR, like you said, uh, in the introduction. But, uh, you know, that that's just wrong because uh, America, as far as I'm concerned, and as a matter of fact, is the original constitution or constitutional communist uh, organization, or infil uh, it, you know, it was infiltrated uh, with the civil war? Was our war? If you look, uh, read the last uh, 
paragraph of the Communist Manifesto, it's done by force. Well, the, uh, the Civil War was the force to create the foundation. The lawful foundation was the 14th Amendment. Of course, that was done by fraud and force. So it's, you know, they'll say it was legally ratified, but it wasn't. Because they took, uh, and we're getting off point, maybe a little bit okay. of the go anar go anarchy, go. but they uh, removed the southern governments. Mm -hmm. They actually went in and took the governors out and replaced the legislatures or held them at gunpoint to uh, get the uh, uh, amendment put in place. That, that's not lawful. I, I don't see that in the Constitution where that's lawful. So it's, it's a fraud from day one. But it was and, a fraud. Uh, but it was a fraud too, when Lincoln reinstituted the Rump Congress after the Southern states walked out. Effectively, right. at that point, the country was over. There was no quorum as it had been established. Right. And and then and then labeled them as the rebellion, and then proceeded to declare war upon them. Right. Unconstitutionally, the, because technically there was no Congress to declare war at this point. And this, by the way, was also the birth of the executive order, as I understand it. It is. For the most part, that's where they started to really be used. And executive orders, and they're playing that game now with uh, COVID. Yeah. Uh, Canada, you know, oh, Canada it's right not, it, 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 they don't have, uh, you know, it's not lawful for the, um, you know, president to do this or the, the uh, governor as well. This is the evil part of the whole thing. And that's what my book's about because they did things unlawfully. I've got a paper called uh, criminal ignorance. It's only about three pages, but it goes over some of the shenanigans that went down uh, with Johnson, not, uh, not uh, Lyndon B, but uh, Andrew Johnson. Yeah. Andrew. Correct. During the civil war. And uh, he rejected what they were trying to do, but they put it in place anyway. But uh, what they had to do is make Americans criminals. That's what they did with Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. Okay, it says go, you can't, you, you can't, yeah, yeah, you can't vote important. unless you participate in rebellion. Sorry. No, no, this is actually a key point, and it's one. Let's go into Section 2 here because... This was one of the things in your book that I went back and forth in my head over and over again. And I'm like, the construction of language in this is so vague. So you go ahead and kind of take over from there with this, because it's an important point to understand, LB. It's very important. I got, I got cussed up and down by people, um, people you would think that are on our side, you know, on the uh, side of right. Uh, or not being on the side of evil would, uh, you know, call me out on it. But they, no one ever said, you know, it just doesn't say that. That's all they'd say. They wouldn't uh, give any papers why it doesn't say that or whatever. They just make the claim. Repeat which is again exactly what that, that says, so you, you know, paraphrase it or how, but what, what does it say? Well, I did. <laughs> this is weird, too. Uh, I did discuss it. I met a, a language professor, and she was old. She actually s said she sat on FDR's lap when she Ew. was a little, little girl. She knew FDR personally. Yeah, I hope he wasn't like but, Biden. Uh, yeah, no kidding. I thought of that. Her name was Ruth. I, I haven't talked to her in years. But believe me, I, I was deep in the movement years ago, but I've been buried because of what's happened. Mm -hmm. But uh, she told me that that was written at an over 30 degree uh, grade level, 30, 30 uh, mixing up with the degrees of masonry, but uh, no, th th 30 grade level section or the whole uh, the whole uh, 14th Amendment or at least section two. And uh, that's beyond college, you know, the first years of college. And uh, she also told me that the Constitution, you know, all these people are talking about capitalization. She goes, that's just the way that Germans wrote. And uh, if you look at all this conspiracy stuff, it goes right back to the Germans, that uh, area. So uh, let, me, let me read this. 
Yeah, I go ahead and read stuff. it, and then we'll, then we'll analyze it. Section 2 of the 14th Amendment says, Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians, not taxed, but when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for president and vice president of the United States, representatives in Congress, because at that time the Senate was appointed by the governors, um, right. representatives of Congress, the executive and judicial, of, judicial officers of a state, or the members of the legislature thereof, is denied any of the male inhabitants of such state being 21 years of age and citizens of the United States or in any way abridged except for and here's here, here it is except for participation in rebellion or other crime the basis of representation therein shall be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens 21 years of age in such a state. I have no idea where to even put semicolons in some of this. Yeah, it's uh, orchestrated pretty uh, cl cleverly. Sorry, what the hell does know? this mean? You know, and I'm <laughs> reading it now and it still feels like I'm speaking in an alien language because they have all these inclusions and then these exemptions. I'm not right. clear on who's exempted. I mean, it's obvious mm -mm, they don't seem to like Indians. And they don't seem well, to like they, women. You know what that's doing? Because I've studied law. They're just saying that the Indians aren't part of the states and they're not taxed. And another thing it tells you is the Constitution's for taxing you. But that ties to the head tax and the census of the original Constitution. And if you look at any Constitution today, they'll say they haven't repealed any of that. They just overrode it or had it overwritten by Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. So uh, they were going to replace the head tax, which is, uh, you know, they tax everyone for being alive and whatever. But the Indians weren't included in that back okay. then. So uh, in the Constitution or the 14th Amendment, there was an act of Congress in the 1900s that brought them into the sheepfold of the communist system. They were given citizenship. Mm -hmm. by Congress, which is done under Section 5 uh, of the in, in enforcement of the amendment. These people are insurgents. They're, they're actually, actually traitors to their states. As a matter of law, anyone participating in, participating in this government is in treason to their lawful state. Yeah. And if you prune the language out and the operations of law that uh, come together in Section 2, you, you read two sentences. It's the first one, which said everyone's represented. Mm -hmm. then, then the second sentence is, well, some of these people are no longer represented. And that's what section uh, par a paragraph of Section 2 does. It eliminates some of the people for some reasons. And... If you prune out all the extraneous language, it says the right to vote is denied except for participation in rebellion. And it's not the rebellion that they conjured up with hyperbole bullshit uh, uh, that they uh, charged the Confederate forces with. And there's actually court cases where the Supreme Court said, no, they, they weren't rebels. But they use that psyche or that stigma from that and rewrote the uh, 14th Amendment and changed it around. It's a thing they call, uh, okay. they turn things upside down. And that's Inverted. basically what, oh, invert, inversion, yeah, thank inversion. you. Yeah. yeah, very good, thank you, inversion. They inverted it in people's minds, so they think, well, there's this idiot called Tom Woods, and I dedicated a paper to him. He's Tom Woods Jr. He's a show for the Vatican, basically. Yeah, I know who he and, is. Uh, you know, yeah. Anyway, he's a he said, well, uh, they don't use this section anymore. And I go, what? It's a constitution. It's perpetual. There's no sunset date on this. You know, so he's a, he's a fraud, too. So 
but he's got, you know, listeners. But that's how the operatives work, you know. They uh, get out there and sound like they talk like, the, you know, they talk like and sound like they know what they're talking about. But they don't. They're, they're defrauding everyone. But that's Marxism, you know. Yeah. There's a, there's a, a section in the Communist Manifesto where Marx says, we're going to turn everything upside down and backwards. And that's what they do, and it's that inversion thing that we just noted. That, that, that's, so, that's basically the story of our culture, is that everything's in an inversion. That yes, everything's it, upside down. It's, this, is, this is actually the joke that runs through a lot of pop culture and has since the 1960s. Uh -huh. Look at the, the, the Beatles lyrics and John Lennon saying nothing is real and we'd love to turn you on. And there's all this, all right. this that's laced through the culture. Like I said, I'm a victim of, of my own cultural literacy sometimes. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll appropriate it, but I'd like, to, I'd like to think beyond it. And I understand a lot of people who listen to me understand I use these inversions as a way to kind of watermark the content because it's like they understand that I know that that's bullshit, that it's an inversion, but let's use it anyway because the words themselves can actually be redeemed through a thought process that brings you back into alignment again rather than embracing the, the, the corporate lies that we live by. All of that said, I want to bring this back again to, you know, this uh, because... I know that you and I probably in the early days of our um, online association, we kind of went at it over some of the things that you said about anarchy and stuff. Because I, I actually had for a long time considered myself a soft anarchist, mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. I don't embrace any structure of government and seeing oneself as being sovereign within ourself. And I think you're more on the line of there is a structure, it's already in place, and we need to reinstitute it. That, tell me if I'm wrong about that. No, you're right. Uh, one thing that uh, there's a guy named Lee Brobst, he did a lot of research. And he wrote a paper called uh, that I ran into, I don't know, 96, whenever it was, 97, when I had a chance to get on the Internet. It was probably almost... Uh, when I was doing my research, it was probably 97, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote a paper called USA, the Republic that no one lives in. I think that's the title. I'm bad with verbatim quoting. It's I wish I had that. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, he uh, mentioned an act called the, I don't know. It's called act of uh, an act for, the rights of Americans in foreign states, something to that mm. that language. But anyway, um, I had already determined determined by reading you know, this, the code and studying law that uh, people had to expatriate or get rid of uh, the U.S. nationality that they assigned uh, under the 14th Amendment. And there's a lot of acts that, that did that. But this uh, Brobst. I didn't see the uh, the root or the uh, uh, act for that, that where all this came from, which was in the code, which I appreciate Brope's finding it. And to be honest, I spent little time in law libraries because you could get documents on uh, CDs and such back then. So I didn't have to go to the law library. But it was so important to me that I went to the uh, ASU Law Library and made sure it was true. I looked it up. Uh, but anyway, the, it, I refer to it as the Expatriation Act. And uh, it's got interesting language in it. And I should probably pull it up and read it. It's so important. Why, why don't you do that? Uh, or, or why don't you uh, hold on a second? Talk, talk a bit while I pull that up. Well, okay, you're, you're going to pull that up. Um, um, there's a lot packed into this, and this is really the meat that I wanted to get into, LB, because what we're trying to do now is slipstream this back into the consciousness of people at a time when they critically need it, and hopefully some of them will embrace what we're, we're talking about, but uh, it's, late in, it's late in the hour, people. Um, 
we are down the treacherous divide here and we have to look for solutions and that's why we have LB on. I've always thought this has to be political, you know, stay out of their courts because they're all corrupt and criminals mm -hmm. and they're going to cover this up. The only way to do this is with the masses understanding what's happened. And uh, I believe that if we had enough people, we could push it through and get it recognized by the Supreme Court. And if they don't, you know, there's there's no hope. These people are criminals, but that's the next stage of what they're going to do. And I brought it up in my book, and that's what they're trying to do now. Uh, getting off the point, that we'll get back to it. I still haven't been able to pull that up. But uh, what's going to happen is is they, they put it right in Title Eight of the U.S. Code that they're uh, going to create communistic totalitarian dictatorships in all countries of the world. Uh, the Fourteenth Amendment. They being who? Well, the Illuminati, if you want to call them that, okay. I call them Luciferians. Yeah, it's a synagogue of Satan's behind mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. It's an axis. It, 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 it's uh, my my studies have told me, and someone backed this up that also studies. They said Satan basically means adversary in Hebrew, yeah. I believe. Yeah, it does. So. Anyone that doesn't follow God is following Satan. And I believe man is Satan. There, there's some people that believe there's a satanic en entity. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But who's the adversary of God? Man is the only one that could be. The synagogue of Satan is the people that are guiding people away from God and natural law. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what I've come up with. I've uh, told this to a few people. And if they don't have that clutter in their mind, like you kind of mentioned, that you have, and I had it too. I'm, I'm not perfect from her or, uh, you know, immune from all this junk that's out there. I was just lucky and didn't pay attention in school and stuff like that <laughs> as much as most people do. So I wasn't brainwashed with the crud that uh, these people have pushed on us. You know, like you said, it's in the music and everything. And the Beatles are part of uh, the communist revolution, but they, they don't even, you know, I, I don't even know how much they knew, you know? I don't think they knew much. I don't think most people who are tools understand their tools because they're given a comfortable lifestyle. They're given whatever they want. Right. You see, this they is, sold their soul to the devil. They sold their soul they, they, see, this is to man. man. That's the allure to all this. Evil isn't what most people think it is. Right. It, it, it has a guise to it. It appears as like a comfortable life. It appears as a life that you'd want. I mean, how many people dream of growing up and becoming a rock star or a movie star or something like that. And yet, right. if you look at these industries, um, it's a it, it's a road of death. I mean, there's just bodies all over the road from this. Well, that's how you know, because that's what the adversary, that's what Satanism is. And, right. I, and I don't have a problem saying that because there are real world Luc there are real world Luciferians that operate. I've known this since I was a kid, and I was warned about this by my grandfather, who was a fairly high Mason, about how the operations of the system work. Now he was part of it. Most of my family was part of it in some way. We're all part of it in some way, and the most important thing is extricating ourselves from this how do we right. how do we do this how do we get ourselves extricated from this system that's the hard part because they have control and, and people probably don't have a clue but communism is my esti in my estimation and no one can fight it or you know say it's not is the takeover of the economies of all the world's uh, countries so they control everything. The, as you mentioned uh, in the introduction today, um, this is a commercial plantation. that They started this off as a business enterprise. The Constitution basically represents a business enterprise. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. it. It's simple as that. It, it, and uh, it needs to be done away with and replaced with a, a you know, a, a federal constitution of the people. And that's 
where the ring project goes, uh, you know, to educate people and it, it suggests that, but I'm going to be putting up a notice that, uh, goes into these issues pretty quick here and, uh, expose this and, and basically call them to the, the, you know, the, uh, call them down, uh, on the fraud and uh, get people educated. The only way this is going to happen is people start working together. And that's why I get so upset. And, uh, it's, I, I don't know. What's your opinion on, you know, I, I don't hear from any of the people. There's been thousands of people that have gotten the Red Amendment, and mm -hmm. I don't hear from them anymore. Are they afraid, do you think? Yeah, or, I, think, I think I'll tell you what. I, I'll tell you what. It, I'm sitting here. I have my spiral-bound copy of the Red Amendment in front of me. It's pretty dog-eared and tattered and highlighted right. and post-its. It's... I, on one level, it's intimidating. Most people were mentally lazy. Most people were lazy right. in general. And it throws down the gauntlet, at the very least, that you're left with the conclusion that this is something you don't want to be a part of. And there's what I've been telling people for years is you go through a process of awakening. Some Everybody's different. Everybody has their own speed. They have their own emotional environment they operate in. But the biggest thing you're going to notice is it's going to hurt like hell. It is not fun. When you wake up and you start to realize that the system, the world as you know it, disregarding the cartoon annex of the Matrix or V for Vendetta type stuff, this is, I not, that movie. <laughs> this, is not a, this is not a romantic journey here. This is somebody throwing cold water on you, laying in a nice warm bed. It's not fun. The right. other side of it is that I think there comes this resistance to the idea that you're going to have to think for yourself and work for yourself and navigate a system that doesn't have any clear borders. Because the law system is as fluid as anything I've ever seen in terms of how courts operate, legal documents are filed. Um, the operations of government are not as linear as we think they are. It's almost like a, a giant amoeba sometimes in the way it seems to subdivide. But my takeaway from the from the Red Amendment is it's a book that you need to sit down with, read parts of it, process it, and go through it very carefully. It's very well structured. It's very well written. It's annotated. It contains within it a huge amount of information. The information itself isn't what I would call the catalyst for change, it catalyzes you to begin to conceive how you can begin to operate in this. And, and I guess having said that, one of the things that it's left me with and what PAC has done over the years is that we kind of semi have a structure for this maybe, and we need to begin to cement that. But the reason why it doesn't work is because exactly what you said. People were divided. Look at the world right now. Look at the divisions that have been laced into our psyche. Is it just a result of this so-called pandemic or the political divisions that have taken place? I mean, the, the, which stooge president do you want to vote for next? We want our stooge president back from the previous term, the one that he, they stole the election from him. It's like everybody steals elections. Are you kidding me? The greatest hero of the 20th century in some people's minds, JFK, stole the election. I'm sorry. That's just a fact. Elections are stolen all the time. They're stolen by definition when you read the Red Amendment. Well, that, that's a problem. People don't realize that they've been set up. And uh, I, I got that uh, section of the Expatriation Act up, and I could read it right. and explain it. But Section 2 turns people into criminals, where in a sense they're turned into slaves. And they can do whatever they want with them, the, the citizens of people. That, that's the psyche of the government. Can you, can you send me a link for that then, so I can put that up with this? What, uh, I'm reading out of a document called okay. called I Have Some Questions. Okay, go ahead. I, I've got tons of writings. Uh, it, they used to get a lot of hits and shared, but they, they've died too. Yeah. It's like uh, PAC needs to be re rebirthed, and I'm doing it with the Ring Project you know, is what uh, I'm trying to get done. 
But again, we need people on board. Anyway, the preamble of this act, it was, uh, inter- interestingly enough, it was installed. I'm not going to say uh, legally put in place because it wasn't. It's part of the, it wasn't ratified properly. It's put in place by the Rome Congress that you talked about. Uh, these guys are insurgents. They broke the Constitution to do this. Uh, so uh, that, that's another thing about this fake insurrection. Uh, they're using my interpretation of sex, sex, Section 3 of the amendment to keep Trump out of office. Now, it's all dog and pony show theory, theater. And my question is, how do you have an insurrection on top of an insurrection? <laughs> It's like a Russian. So it's all these guys are frick, they're 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 freaking clowns. Anyway, the preamble of this act says uh, it's called Rights of American Citizens in Foreign States, and it's talking about the states. Each one is a, each state in the union is foreign to one another, and the, the states are foreign to the United States. And it goes, whereas the right of expatriation is a natural and inherent right of all people, indispensable to the enjoyment of rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And that's a catchphrase that I want to get into. The pursuit and liberty and pursuit of happiness are both bad terms. And whereas in the recognition of this principle, this government, this government, this is before they went de facto, the day before the 14th Amendment was put in place, has freely received immigrants from all nations and invested them with the rights of citizenship. Now, here's a kicker in the preamble, which has no force and effect of law, according to law, or the way they do things, but it, it shows intent and in what they're doing. And it says, and whereas it is claimed that such American citizens, all the old citizens are the ones that were put in place or had citizenship before the Civil War, with their descendants, that means you and me, are subjects of foreign states, owing allegiance to the governments thereof. That's the states. And whereas it is necessary to the maintenance of public peace that this claim of foreign allegiance should be promptly and finally disavowed. This is where they stole by their wish that all people of America, the, the, the several states, give allegiance to the federal government, which a guy named, uh, I think it was Francis Bellamy, wrote that right. uh, drivel and he was, to get people to give allegiance to the United States, he, which started out as the Pledge of Allegiance. He was, he was a... He was a, a, a a footman for the Vatican. Right. Yep. It was, um, uh, what is the Catholic men's group? Anyway. The, yeah, they say he was a Christian, by the way. He was Catholic. Yeah, b- by the way, I, I don't consider myself a Christian because it's so convoluted and a mess. No, that's the way I've gone too, LB. I, I've had to separate myself from all of that. Right. I, I follow Yeshua. Yeah. I, I believe, uh, you know, in the so-called Jesus Christ, which Christ just means redeemer. So uh, I believe in his mission and what he's, he did. That's where I'm at. But I don't consider myself a Christian because you're stepping into a deep pile of crap there. Oh, yeah, yeah, anyway. definitely. I want to get anyway. Back. I want back. to read section one okay. here because it's important. Section yes. one, the other two sections are not that important. It's just drivel as far as I'm concerned. Section one, right of expatriation declared. This is law. Therefore, be it enacted by the state and house of the representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled that any declaration, instruction, opinion, order, or decision of any officers of this government which denies, restricts, impairs, or questions the right of expatriation is hereby declared inconsistent with the fundamental pr- principles of this government. Okay, when they codified this later, they changed principles of this government to principles of the republic. So the republic that gets back which, to what, which republic is that now? The, 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 the federal republic. Okay. Which 
there is a federal republic, but it's not noted in the Constitution. The states are recognized as several republics. And this is where it gets interesting, because because now we're talking about what most people. Well, they'll just tell you to put your tinfoil hat on and be a conspiracy theorist because of that. No, this is law. This insa- I know it is. I know it's law. But the truth of the matter is most people do not recognize that they are citizens of their states. And most states don't recognize that they are actually nations. In- no, they do. Well, they, they haven't been taught that. No one's been taught that. Well, one of the things I had to recognize by studying in international law is the Constitution is nothing but a, a, a treaty between the states. That's what they, they present it as. But really, it represents a private enterprise. So they've used people of the states and in international law to screw everyone over and deceive them to set up this enterprise. So that's why I'm saying to fix all this, the people, the lawful people of the states which has to be decided who gets to vote in a, a plebiscite to decide to get rid of the federal government. That ultimately has to be done. That's what's got to start to change. But my, my thing is that uh, through the communism, uh, to get people on board is uh, have them not pay that, you know, uh, start uh, people understanding that they don't have to pay uh, wage tax wages, which is directly tied to the Communist Manifesto. Mm-hmm. No, no one uh, sh- that's uh, a wage slave should be having to pay income tax on their wages. That, that's that's theft. Well, not only that, it actually is contradictory to the original law wording of the original law and court decisions that said. That income, strictly speaking, is the proceedings from a business venture, and there's um, no, not 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 just a not a business venture, corporation. Corporation. That's Bush Aber. The was that the Bush Aber decision? Uh, Ashwan uh, Ashwander. No, no, it's not Ashwan. This is Ashwander rule. Okay. That they used, but that that uh, is something they came up with to. Uh, decide what they're going to hear in the Supreme Court or not. If you're taking benefit, uh, the the short uh, version of that, if you're taking benefits of a statute, be it a, a state or a federal, you you can't uh, argue this is a gray area of this damn system. Yeah, yeah. That's what they did. They created a gray area. You cannot fight or reach constitutional grounds. You can't say it's unconstitutional because you're you're taking privileges. From the 14th Amendment. But the Constitution also, and the 14th Amendment, says there's immunities, which I'm under. I don't have to participate in this communist rebellion created created by the 14th Amendment. So all these statutes, they don't apply to me. They can't apply to me. And there's other way, ways in the code to fight that. And I'm telling you, the system of government could be taken down within a few months if people just listen but that shows you how everyone's so so compartmentalized especially lawyers they're they're nit nitwits yeah you ever seen the uh, in the midwest here we have these signs you go into these little towns masons free and accepted yeah yeah uh you're not free if you got a social security number and i don't accept you so I don't know where they get that from. I guess that's something they just claimed. Well, they got those little signs everywhere. That, to me, is the equivalent of a dog pissing on a tree to mark its territory. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're criminals. Yeah. They're all evil, and I'm sorry to hear your dad was one of them. Oh, my whole family was. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're, they're just useful idiots. They are, and and unfortunately, that's part of the, the mind control that they've, they've sown in, right. into the culture. Right. Uh, their, their minions are out there. So, you know, we have this, this predicament where extrication from the system, what does that look like? What, as somebody who's, you know, coming upon this, hopefully on YouTube or somewhere, here's this. Can you kind of toss a few breadcrumbs? I mean, I, I will say now, anybody that hears this, 
get the Red Amendment, and we'll put the links up, let people know where they can find you, the Red Amendment, Pack, the Ring, and anything else you're working on right now, LB. So what is the, the website these days for Pack and for the Red Amendment? Well, there's nine websites, <laughs> and they all yeah, handle something different. I think, uh, which is the slowest site right now, I'm setting it up for phones or mobiles, mobile devices, whatever you want to call them. Mm-hmm. But it's still up. Uh, it's packandlaw.us. Okay. And if you go to that page, there's a splash page that works on phones. It's legible. You can read it. But there's a, a list of all the nine websites at the bottom. And there's a contact uh, part there, which there is on, on all the websites at the bottom of the page. Uh, extreme bottom extreme uh, right. It's the last thing. If you need to contact okay, one us, more a form. that website again. P-A-C-I-N-L-E-W dot U-S. Got it. And that's going to wrap it for this hour of the conversation. All of the full-length interviews, exclusive podcasts, and other materials can be found on my Patreon site at patreon.com forward slash Randy Moggins. The truth is inside you. Go find it. Peace out. This is Off Planet Radio.